I'm Dr. Norma Braun, Chairman of the Archives Committee of Mount Sinai St. Luke's and Mount Sinai West, and we're here today to interview Dr. Stanley Cortell, who is going to tell us a little bit about himself and his career. So we're going to start at the beginning with where you were born and where you were trained and where you were raised okay. and how you became a doctor. Hmm. Well, I was born in uh, Boston, Mass, and went to the public schools in Brookline, Mass, and uh, then attended MIT as my, my college and graduated from MIT with a Bachelor of Science in uh, 1957 and then went to Tufts Medical School where I graduated and graduated from there in uh, 1961. Uh, the question of why I went to medicine is an interesting one. Uh, I went to MIT with the intention of being a metallurgist and uh, why a metallurgist? And I can't tell you all the reasons but one of the reasons was my father was a jeweler oh. and I thought maybe that had some bearing. But at, when I was in the eighth grade, we had to write a career book and I wrote a career book on my career in the metallurgical profession, believe it or not. And I went to MIT and uh, at MIT, MIT was, a, was an extraordinary place and probably educationally had them biggest impact on my, on my, my life because it taught me how to think and that was really what the, the, the uh, basic content of the knowledge was not imp as important at MIT as it was how you got there. And as an anecdote I can tell you that I can remember a calculus exam as a, in this, my sophomore year in which the professor, and they never cared whether you got the right answers. They only cared whether you showed the method and approach to it. And I, I got a 99 on that exam. And uh, it, the note from the professor was, I couldn't give you 100 because you added 3 plus 2 and got 6. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that was MIT. But in the second year at MIT in metallurgy, you had to take a course called Applied Mechanics. Mm -hmm. which was resolving the forces. It's what, it was in the, in the uh, civil engineering department and you had to, it was resolving forces. It was the kind of course that people who built bridges had to take so they could figure out the forces on. And it was, it was okay. I didn't do well in that course, but it, it was okay, except in the second semester, it was called dynamics. And now you had to resolve the forces on things while they were moving, okay? And I looked at what I was doing and I said, you know, it's clear that metallurgy isn't enough of a people profession for me. I needed people. So I got a job for the summer as a, as a uh, what, what was it called? At the Peter Bear Brigham Hospital. Orderly? Orderly. Guess the word. I got a job as an orderly at the Peter Bear Brigham Hospital. Now in those days, None of those jobs were unionized, mm -hmm. so there were, I think, six of us. There was one other person who went to college, but the chief orderly was a terrific guy, but he was high school educated. And he went on vacation for a week, and I was in college, so they made me chief orderly for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and it was clear that this was the turning point in my life, but I can re still remember that there was a professor of surgery at Harvard, I have no idea what his name was, who was having an operation and needed an enema. And I have, of course, orderlies in those days were the Did people that. who gave the enemas, the pre-op enemas. They're, they're called uh, attendants now. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure orderly, is the, that word is long gone. Long gone. But in any event, I gave him an enema, probably the first enema I had ever given. And at the end, he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I think I'm going to go to medical school. And he said, if you need a reference, I'll be happy to write a reference. <laughs> That's <right>. marvelous. <laughs> so Based that, on an enema, wow. So that, that uh, experience, that summer, convinced me that, it was, that maybe it was medicine that I should go for. 
And uh, that's the way I ended my career and eventually uh, majored in what they called at MIT quantitative biology, which means I took biochemistry and biophysics and everything quantitative. It was, it was great. And uh, um, when I went to medical school, you wonder in retrospect how your life would be different. You know, I was accepted to medical schools out of the Boston area, but I went to Tufts and had a great four year, four year experience, um, including the fact that I published research. And because of the, my background, I, I had loads of opportunities to work with biochemists and things at, at medical school. And uh, now when I, when I finished medical school, it's very interesting. Um, I met my wife while we were in medical school, and her father was was a real intellect. And although his his background was as a Harvard graduate in the arts, he read everything, and made me read everything. I was good. Yes. <laughs> and so I decided that maybe I wanted to. Oh, I'm sorry. I should go back one step. During my third year, I went across the street from the medical school to the hospital and heard William B. Schwartz give grand rounds. Oh, wow. And I decided at that point I wanted to be him. However, I got sidetracked. I left medical school and I took an internship at the University of Chicago. And I decided because of all this reading I was doing that maybe psychiatry was something I should do. So I actually took a residency in Boston at Boston University in psychiatry. Um, however, it was very clear listening to uh, patients, depressed patients for 40 minutes was more than I could handle. And uh, there was nothing quantitative about what I was doing. So I went back. And I didn't decide until November that that's what I wanted to do. And I got a residency position at Wisconsin the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which was a great year. However, in those days, you had to get, have a deferment. So I was very planned. Uh, was, was Vietnam planned. War. Yeah, I was very planned. And, but I was very planned in psychiatry. So I took my year of, at Wisconsin and they told me it was time for me to pay them back. Mm. So, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do, I mean, to be a psychiatrist in the Army for two years. So I just wrote a letter to Washington and said I wanted to be in research. I took a, I, I went down to Washington, had an interview with somebody, I had no idea who it was, and um, got, got my orders which said, you're assigned to Walter Reed direct. Now that was extraordinary because wow. it meant I didn't have to have basic training, I mean I didn't have to go to Fort Sam Houston or any place else. And right. I spent two wonderful years at, at Walter Reed in Washington doing research. Hematology research because the head of medicine was a guy named William Crosby, who was a very well-known hematologist. And he said, look around and decide what you want to do. And I said, gee, I'd like to go to the renal section. And he said to me, how would you like to do research on iron metabolism? What do you say to the colonel? You say, yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. You say, yes, sir. And so I spent two years basically doing hematology research, but it, it didn't really make any difference. I had more publications in that two years than probably any, any other two-year period in my life. Um, and it was a, a very wonderful experience. And, and I uh, uh, arranged to finish my uh, residency, because I only had one year, remember finished my residency at uh, New England Medical Center and uh, Bill Schwartz had by then accepted me for fellowship. Um, <clears throat> now it's interesting, one wonders about life. Um, after I had accepted the position, I got a notice, because I had applied to a number of places, I got a notice from the Mass General that you were, I was accepted for residency. <laughs> And I went and said to Bill Schwartz, should I take it? What should I do? And he said, the honorable thing is not to take it because you've accepted the position, but I'll love you 
whether you take it or not. Oh, that was kind. I didn't take it in the long run. I, it wouldn't have made a difference in my life. And so I spent the, my one more year as resident and then I, a fellowship. Now, fellowship is generally two years. At the end of the um, first year, Bill Schwartz said to me, I can't teach you anymore. Uh, why don't you become an attending? So I only had one year of <laughs> one year of fellowship and then became an attending at, uh, at the medical center. And, uh, you know, I was a, uh, a training grant recipient. And uh, by the time I left, I had an R01 from the National Institute of Health. And then I was approached uh, by, but I always had trouble with the Wingo Medical Center because it was a very middle class hospital. Mm. And I never knew whether I was really needed if I left, whether the patients would miss me, if you, mm -hmm. if you will. And I had gone to a dinner. My Bill Schwartz had been elevated to chief of medicine. And there was a dinner and I sat next to a former trainee of his who was chief at Pittsburgh. And he turned to me and he said, Stan, would anybody miss you if you died? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> he wasn't talking about my family. Right, he went right. Up. And that kind of stimulated me as to maybe I should look and see whether I was doing what I needed to do. I actually, during the Nixon administration, went down to Washington and they tried to recruit me for the, what was then the Department of Health. To be, and, and I, as a result of that, I did do some part-time work for the FDA for years. I, I reviewed hypertensive and renal drugs on a part-time basis for the, for the FDA for more than 10 years. But I didn't move. I would fly down in the morning and fly back on the last flight and give them two days in one day of, mm. of FDA counseling. Um, then I got a call. I guess when, when, when um, the Division of Nephrology at St. Luke's was headed by somebody named David David, whom I never met. Mm. I never met. He had gone by the time. By the time I was recruited, but Ted Van Italy appointed a search committee consisting of Alice Maniaris. Oh yes. Who, well, Alice, I must, is back in Greece for a yeah. hundred years. Who was wonderful lady, and, and Connie Lattice. And I don't remember whether there was anybody else. Maybe Ted was himself on the. I don't remember, but. They came and recruited me to come to, to St. Luke's. And um, I have to start with an anecdote, really, about Norma Braun. Oh, no, no. She, has to, she fits in this first year. So in 1975, I arrived in, it, at St. Luke's, and we lived for a year in Chappaqua. Oh. The first house was in Chappaqua. But it was much too long for me to go back and forth, yeah, especially commute. when I was all by myself and had to go back a second time occasionally. So um, that's when we uh, moved from there to, to Scarsdale. But, but during that first year, and um, Norma invited my wife and me, Carl and Norma, because I didn't even know Norma. Norma, you were still at Presbyterian, mm -hmm. as far as I remember, 1975. I but I knew Carl, certainly who parenthetically is probably the best clinician I ever met in my career. But um, I was invited to dinner. And uh, I learned a couple of things. Norma presented a magnificent Chinese banquet to us. Magnificent is my memory of it. <laughs> and um, I learned from her that she wasn't supposed to learn how to cook because she came from this upper crust of Chinese society. She had to learn from the cooks in the kitchen, kitchen. she told us. And that's, that's right. how she learned to cook. That was the first thing she told us. The second thing she told us was that, that Chinese people, when they eat, bend over their food because they, when they use the chopsticks, they bend over and they scoop it up. it up. And her father, if they sat up too straight, would come by and push their heads down. Is that, is that a true memory? That, that was true. My father, we had to be perfect manners, including how we held our chopsticks. If not, he would clunk us across the <laughs> knuckle if we didn't hold our chopsticks correctly. So n now, um, now I'm at St. Luke's, and um, I'm really by myself. Um, 
I was the only attending in nephrology. Lou Wright, who had finished his fellowship, stayed on as an mm -hmm. attending with me for a year. And there was one fellow who, uh, who also I inherited, who stayed on. So there was basically the three of us. But in 1976, I brought two of my fellows from Boston, Trudy Lefebvre and Jeff Brentsilva. Oh, yeah. Um, both of whom were terrific. I mean, they were great attendings. And they both stayed at St. Luke's for over 20 years. Mm, I remember. They both stayed for over 20 years. Um, and I noticed by accident, um, because whoever sent you an email included me on the email by accident, that you're seeing Jane Lattice this afternoon. Yes. And uh, although I haven't seen Jane now for, oh, 30 years, 25 years, Connie was a very big part of my life during the first almost 10 years of my, until he died actually, at, mm -hmm. at uh, St. Luke's. Um, Connie, uh, not only would he come into my office and sit across the desk between operations and kind of pass the time, but he was a, a really a part of our family. When my two-year-old son had a hernia that needed a repair, who repaired it but Connie Lattice. Now that was, that was in um, 1976, 1977. Connie Lattice, when I told the story to Fred Kimmelsteel, Connie's student, couldn't believe that Connie was doing pediatric surgery. Today he would never have been able to do it. They would never have allowed him right, to do it. Right, right. Not with and, um, The separation of powers. Right, separation <laughs> of powers. Then um, my wife had a, had a hysterectomy uh, around that time. And the hysterectomy was done by, I can't remember his name, he was that gynecologist who was pro-abortion and then became anti-abortion. Uh, oh, who, yes, who, Hall. Like, hmm? Robert Hall. No, no. No, that wasn't his name. In, in any event, the night before my wife was to have his hysterectomy, she came, he came in the room and scared the life out of her. Scared the life out of her. I told her she didn't have to do it, if she didn't want it, she, you know. And uh, Connie was very much aware of it and also the wonderful chaplain at St. Luke's who ultimately had some Alzheimer's disease and died at Roosevelt. Chaplain Sweeter? Was it Chaplain Sweeter? Yes. He was a wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. He, he came and was very, very helpful to us. And Connie actually scrubbed in with this obstetrician and closed mm. Sharon at the end of the operation. So I have very, very strong, fond memories of of that period. And of course, we, we, Connie was very instrumental in keeping the transplant program going at, at St. Luke's and a terrific surgeon, very good surgeon. Okay, so then from, uh, by the time I was at St. Luke's for two years, Bill Clark decided to retire, I guess, from the Department of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And whoever was responsible for hiring asked me if I would be the acting director of medicine for one year. That's what it was supposed to be for one year. And I, it ended up being five years, not one year. It ended up being until St. Luke's and Roosevelt combined. So until I, Jerry Torino then came as the first combined chairman, but it was, it was that five year period. And it was an interesting period in medicine because um, we only had, I think, 17 interns at St. Luke's. Something very small, manageable number. And I made a couple of goals for myself. One was that I would know all the house officers' names. And you don't know what a chore that is for somebody like me. Hmm. <clears throat> but I learned and knew everybody's, everybody's name for that five-year period at least. <clears throat> Don't ask me now what their names were. But. <laughs> <clears throat> In any event, it, the uh, Department of Medicine really, the training program was really in disarray when I started. There was no formal rounds and uh, people weren't coming. Even grand rounds had become less than well attended. And uh, the couple of things I, I changed, I made morning report a 
major aspect. Of it. I started an intern's report, made grand rounds, a more prominent part of the week's activity, and also I went back to what I had what I had learned in Boston, and that was for at least a brief period of time, we had chief residents who had completed their residency. So that the chief resident now was somebody who had finished residency and was in this interim period between the end of residency and their career. <clears throat> now we could get away with it then because it was hard to get a hospital appointment. You weren't, it wasn't easy to finish your residency, okay, I'm going to practice and say, looks, we'll give me an appointment. So the, the deal was that if you did this chief residency, you'd get an appointment at St. Luke's if you wanted to. And we had some great chief residents. Michelle Winter, I don't know whether you remember her. I sure do. Greg Gustafson, who was mm -hmm. a cardiologist. And there were two others whose names I've, I've, I've lost in my memory. <laughs> but because they were senior and had maturity, it lent a lot of support to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To me, so it was a very uh, it, uh, oh, oh the other thing that happened in that period was the the categorical internship was basically started in St. Luke's. We were the first hospital in the city to do it, and we were it worked out that it worked because <clears throat> I I made an agreement with the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia that we would accept for categorical interns anybody they accepted into their residency program. And I think we had four slots, as I recall. And that was easy because the, their candidates were terrific people. I mean, very, very competitive <coughs> people. And that, that worked out uh, very well. Let me see if I've forgotten everything I wanted to do. Uh, oh, well, I wanted to ask you two more about your research, whether you, you started yeah, that start. early yeah, and start. then we, did you have a chance to right. build on it, expand it? <clears throat> I did, uh, when I came to St. Luke's in 1975, in addition to Jeff and Trudy Lefebvre, I brought my laboratory technician with me. Uh -huh. And we had two more years, a renewal of our R01, which I which was a micropuncture research, a very basic project, which I continued um, with, in collaboration with my long-term colleague who became the chief of nephrology in Vermont, um, and finished that grant and published a number of papers through that. It was very clear, however, that I couldn't do basic research and run the department and meet my clinical responsibilities. So the research that I did from the oh, 1980s through the, was all collaborative. Some of it very basic. I did a lot of very collaborative research with um, the Department of, of Chemical Engineering at Columbia, mm -hmm. Ed Leonard. I remember. Was professor of, met, professor of, uh, of Chemical Engineering, still is in fact. Um, and we did a lot of collaborative studies um, together, and uh, um, published eventually about somewhere between 60 and 70 papers in, in referee journals. The CV I sent you has mm -hmm. edited, I didn't include them all, but mm -hmm. there's no reason to include them all. But I had, a, to me, a very satisfying um, career. I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do the bench research that I had done early in my career, and I really had to, had to uh, do the clinical and administrative requirements that I had to meet. <coughs> okay, so in the, in the division, did you have another question about the research? Well, just curious as to what the focus of the research was. It was always control of sodium metabolism. Mm. <coughs> that was always my basic acid base. I did some st studies in. Um, it's interesting, there's a, a, an app called ResearchGate. Oh, yes. And they send me almost every week the citations, people who have cited articles that I've that written. written. And it's amazing how we, they're citing articles that I published 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that, it's kind of nice, it, it's kind of a nice thing to... to well, it's, it's a collegial extension of, right. of yourself. Right. 
It's very nice. And it's still pertinent. Yeah, some of it is. Okay, so um, when I look at, at uh, St. Luke's, I want to talk a little bit about the division in a minute. Yes. When I look at St. Luke's, I look at it in basically four segments of my career. The first segment was from 1975 until St. Luke's merged with Roosevelt. <clears throat> from the time I came to St. Luke's, the head of medicine at Roosevelt, his name is, escapes me. Was it Nick Christie? Was what? Nick Christie? Yeah, Nick Christie. Yes. <clears throat> he asked me to cover nephrology at Roosevelt because it was, it was Red Ames who has been there forever. Still there. He's still there, I know. <clears throat> but uh, he asked me to do it and I, and I did it. So during the years before the merger, I was basically doing the nephrology for Roosevelt as well as for St. Luke's. So, when the, so that's the first period until the merger. And St. Luke's during that period was, was very different than, uh, than it was even after the merger, after the continuum. It, it kept changing. It kept becoming less personal and more, I would say, corporate, if you when I was farther and farther away from the, from the centers of power, if you will. I didn't mention, I forgot to mention that when I came for my interview to be chief of nephrology at St. Luke's, I noticed on a bulletin board the St. Luke's motto, which also kind of got lost over the years. But at that point, the motto was people who care. I don't know what ever happened to that motto, but that was the motto when I arrived. And that was really when I really felt that that was the way the people at St. Luke's lived, that they really did care. They cared about one another, they cared about their patients. <clears throat> and that I think things changed over time, as I said, became more corporate. So um, in, my, in the Division of Nephrology, over the uh, 38 years, I guess, I was the, was the chief, <clears throat> We, chained, we trained 50 fellows, all of whom completed their residency past their nephrology boards, 100%. Eight of them became attendings at St. Luke's, eight of the... Was James 50. Jones one? Yes, of course. Yeah. James Jones is the happiest and saddest part of the, the latter part of my career. I had identified James when he was a house officer and knew that he was he would be a great fellow. I, I could tell. I mean, he was probably the best house officer during his three years of house staff training. And he was probably the best, um, one of the three best fellows that I ever had. And uh, contributed contributed greatly. And we had, our, the, the, the deepest talks we had in the end was, whether he should go into administration or whether he should stay in clinical medicine. <clears throat> I remember those very well. I felt a, you know, a, a loss that he decided to go into administration because I think he would have contributed a great deal, but that's, James is a sad story. Um, so, as I said, eight of the 50 fellows became attendings at St. Luke's. Many of them went on to um, academic type positions. And I think at the height of the division, if you looked around the city, we had, we were competitive with all of the divisions of nephrology in the mm. city, at least clinically. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. there were people at, at Presbyterian and Mount Sinai who spent their lives in the lab, who did more in terms of turning out research than we did. <clears throat> but from a clinical point of view, I don't think there was anybody better than we were. So that meant, uh, that made me very happy. Um, so that brings me to the, the end of my St. Luke's career, and that was in 2014, I guess. What, what year was it? 14, 13? 13. 14. 13. The end of 13. The, the end, end of 13, 13 yeah. right, right. But I, I stayed on until, for a few months after that, 
<clears throat> and then because of one of my best fellows, Jonathan Lorch, I know him, remember Jonathan. Oh, I remember. Who spent, barely spent his act, after being in art at St. Luke's for 20 years, he took a job at Rogerson, which is at Cornell, and spent 20 years there. And in conversations we had when it was clear that I was leaving and really wanted to work for a couple more years, mm -hmm. he uh, um, arranged for me to meet and to get a job at Rogerson. Um, Rogerson is, a, is the second biggest nephrology provider in the city now. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so I spent almost two years full-time mm. <clears throat> at Rogerson, helping them to develop their programs. And I think I made some contributions to them. Um, and I still spend um, two days a week at a conference helping them to develop a chronic kidney disease clinic, which I do from here today at 1230 is one of them. One of my two days. <clears throat> and that, that's allowed me to, one, keep up with my uh, nephrology, because in order to keep up with these young people who, are, who I'm dealing with, um, I have to know what they're referring to, because they do spend one day a week actually going over individual cases, individual patients, and that's, that's just wonderful for me, because that pushes me to, to keep up to, to date. How about your family life? How did you <clears throat> okay, integrate your family life with your career? Ah, good question. So, um, my first son was born in 1964 when I was a uh, resident in medicine at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, he is now professor of, uh, of political science at Auburn University in Montgomery and head of his department. <clears throat> and he has a, <clears throat> he has the princess. That's our one granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And she is, she is beautiful. The problem with that little cluster of people is that they're in Montgomery, Alabama, mm -hmm. which is a, a bit of a hike, a hike, <laughs> and especially because of my wife, mm. she really can't make the trip anymore. So we were there a year ago, last time, and he's been up a couple of times. He makes an effort to come up, and the glories of FaceTime <clears throat> is that every week at least, and our granddaughter will, will who calls me by the way, more daddy. She <laughs> made she made that up. Instead of grandpa, she calls me more daddy. That's cute. And so she'll, she'll uh, say to her mother and father, who will be in the room, go out, go out and close the door. I want to talk to my... More daddy. You know, and, 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 and Nana. So, <clears throat> which, which she will. And for a long period, she's very bright and very enthusiastic, and that's wonderful. My other son was born eight years later in 1972. So we were still in Boston, so he was born in Concord, Massachusetts. And uh, he is now a vice president of a, of a company that builds um, apartments that include affordable units. Mm. So we, you know, there's these 20%, 30% affordable housing. And he's had a, some very interesting projects. He, there's a, there was a uh, department store in Newark called Hans, H-A-H-N-E, that was very popular at the high end until the Newark riots in mm. the 70s. So it's been closed for 40 years, empty for 40 years. Mm. So his company bought it from the city, I think, for a dollar, you know, with a, mm -hmm. with a plan mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. develop it. And now it has, it has apartments. The uh, Rutgers has moved part of its resources into this beautifully well done. Has a Whole Foods, you know, it's a real part right. of the development. But so that he's very successful, and he has three wonderful sons. But you know, I'm in my early eighties now, 
and my oldest grandson is seven. Wow. So that's when, if you look at my parents and my wife's parents, they were in their fifties when we had our children. And so it's, it's different. So. Yeah. Well, they're, they're delaying marriage and child rearing. Uh, well, especially for sons, I think. Both. They're we, both. Really? Yeah, they are. I know. I think there's a lot of difference. Yeah, because our sons didn't have their children until right. their late, right. late thirties. What, what 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 was your reaction to the various um, affiliations? I mean, first was Roosevelt, then beyond. Yeah, well, I start, I'll with... start first with Columbia. Um, one of the main reasons I took the job in the first place was because of its relationship with Columbia and because of Ted Van Italy and what he had done to St. Luke's and where he had brought it. And I have to say, for the first, um, oh, I would say for most of my career, the relationship with Columbia was a very, very positive relationship. They were, Columbia was very supportive. During the years that I was chief of medicine, I was made to feel Tom Morris was the acting, I think he was actually the chairman of medicine for a period. He was. And Jerry Thompson, who was the chief at Harlow oh. Hospital. We would meet every month as a group from the, all of the affiliated hospitals, and we were made to really feel very much a part of, of the university. No, um, we trained a third of the class. Right, and they appreciated that. You know, they made me a full professor by, before I was 45, and tenured my title very soon after that. Tenured my title, I learned that as soon as, 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 soon as um, Mount Sinai took over, that tenure meant nothing. Right. But in, in, in any event, um, I was going to say, uh, I served on the promotion committee of more than 50 Columbia professors from the various parts of the, of the and I served on, on PhD review committees from many of the schools, including the School of Social Work, where mm -hmm. I was on a PhD committee for two social worker students getting PhDs. So the relationship with, with Columbia was a very, for me personally, a very positive kind of relationship and, and very, very supportive. Um, <clears throat> affiliations. Roosevelt, I think by the time um, Continuum came on board, Beth Israel never had any impact. I, I think in my 40 years at, or so at St. Luke's, I went to Beth Israel twice or three times. Because so they had, called you or because? Well, there really was no particular reason. They, mm. There was no, nothing there, I mean, for, for me. Mm. Nephrology was a kind of a mixed bag. It always had been at, at did, Beth Israel. Did they have fellows? They did. Nathan Levine was, became the head, and he's still functioning. I don't think he functions at, at Beth Israel anymore because I don't think they have any acute care anymore. They still have some acute care. Okay. I mean, they're so dwindling I down. I'm not sure what, okay. the, what their activity was, but for reasons <clears throat> that are not entirely clear, <clears throat> to me, I have very little to do with Beth Israel. Very little. There were a couple of attempts to, uh, to kind of unify some proposals and some policies, and so I went to a couple of meetings mm. relative to that, but Intellectually, there was no, no relationship for all the years that I was there. Um, other affiliations? What other did you have in mind? We, I sat on the board of the Isabella Nursing Home from the time Arthur Leonard, no, I guess before Arthur Leonard became the chairman, because when I was chairman of medicine, they, we had a very strong relationship with that. Right. With that nursing home. You know, we'd had a geriatrics program starting then right. too. Right, very strong relationship. And so I was put on the medical board. and was on the medical board for at least 15 years of, of Isabella. And I liked that very much. I was very sorry to see that affiliation dwindle and basically to have lost it to Presbyterian in the end, I think. Yeah, but well, that was part of the consolidation with Mount Sinai. Oh, I think it happened before that. I think it was, I think the loss of, of Isabella actually happened 
oh, I would say eight years or ten years almost before the affiliation, that it became less and less strong. It was clear. Well, I think as long as Arthur was running it, it was still there. And then when Arthur died, I thought that mm. was the big change. How long ago was that? Do you have any idea? Oh, gosh. Uh, at least ten years. Yeah, must be. Must be ten years. I see early occasionally in Bronxville Village. I bump into her. Well, she's on my list to be interviewed, but she's declined until the fall because she's spending the Berkshires, uh, summer in the Berkshires this summer. Good for her. Good uh, for her. With her grandchildren. So. Yeah, good for her. Good for her. I like, I like both of them very much. <clears throat> both of those people. I had very positive relationships with loads of people. I doubt that there was anybody I didn't like. I'm trying to think of people I can remember. <laughs> Getting angry only once. I I really have control of my of my feelings. I really am one of those people. But I can remember a, a, a grand rounds when I was chief of medicine, and Jonas Goldstone, mm. who had a tendency sometimes to be a little on the nasty side, mm -hmm. got up and said something, and I have no idea what the subject is anymore. <clears throat> but I had to say to him, Jonas, sit down. You know, and that was about as much as, and he's well, died, I guess. Yeah, J Jonas had very strong opinions. He was president of the medical board, and right. he was hematologist. Right. So that combination. Um, right. He very was, smart guy. Yep. Things rankled him, and he would speak up when that, right. that happened. Right. That, that's true. But I, I was thinking about whether there were any, and I, and I was like Jonas. I mean, it wasn't any question about this. I can't really think of any other What negative, made What made you stop? at St. Luke's. I mean, you came here at the very early part of your career, right. and there's a tremendous sense of allegiance of, of many of the people who work there. Well, I think I, think I stayed <clears throat> because I was very happy, because I was able to recruit people that I liked to go to, to be with. You know, I told my sons, neither of whom went into medicine, that I didn't care what they did as long as on Monday morning they wanted to get up and do it. And, and I, I did. I, I loved going to work. <clears throat> I was just talking to my secretary yesterday because I asked her to send me the list of fellows. I had no idea whether they were of any value. Of oh, yeah, I think so. We'll add that to our archives. Yeah, yep, thank you, thank you. Um, I, and I, I told her how much I missed her and how much I missed coming in every day. Um, you know, they sequestered her up in this in our 13 someplace now. You should see it. Oh, really? Pigeon holes. Is that what it is? She said that Jermaine shares a desk, but she says they don't even come up anymore. They throw their, their stuff at the hemodialysis unit and do their work. And so, but it, it was a very collegial. In the, in the early days, when we were on Minturn too, we were all there because the dialysis unit was there, and we were all there, and the coffee pot was there, and the conference That's room That's important. There. Yeah, and the conference room was there. <clears throat> In, the, in about 1977 or so, in 1978, we did a, Kalini, did a kidney transplant on a Palestinian Christian and, uh, who was a very wealthy guy. And that resulted in a relationship with him and his family that lasted basically until he died of of, uh, what is it, shingalosis, Shing, shingella? Shigella. Shigella, that you get in your, he had aotitis, shigella aotitis, with a perfectly functioning kidney, which was very sad years later. But, but that resulted in Connie and I going to Israel several times. He had the nurse, the dialysis nurse in Israel as a visit, so that relationship was an interesting one that resulted in several years of, of interrelationships. Um, that doesn't answer why I stayed at St. Luke's all those years. But it, it's in the interactions with people. Right, and I think I really never had um, any, any bad interactions. I think there was a suspicion from administration, and I can't even tell you exactly why, for the, for the first until Michael Lesh became chairman, 
my relationship with the hospital was they paid me a salary and I then billed for all my clinical work, divided it up among the division and paid a certain percentage of that back to the hospital and I don't even remember the percentage anymore. But there was some kind of feeling, I think, that I was making a fortune, that the nephrology was somehow making a lot of money. Well, dialysis does I, that. I guess. I mean, I don't know where it is. Uh, so when, when Michael Lesh finally put together the faculty practice and it finally became viable, the first thing they saw was that we weren't making a fortune. We were doing, doing well, but not, I did, there wasn't any money that was sequestered that, in any way. That was the only, uh, the, only, the only feeling that I had. Um, and things changed. The other things that changed, when Jeff Brensilver moved up to the Department of Medicine, that kind of, kind of left, he left the department and had to be replaced. And Mike Greco, now when, when did Mike Greco, did Jeff and Mike Greco overlap? I don't even remember anymore. Yeah, they did. I'm for pretty little, sure that they did, yeah. Time. Because I think it was during Mike Greco's time that Jeff decided to leave. Mm. It must have been. Things changed in that in that period. Inevitably. In that period of time, too. Well, Torino was brought down as a first Keating chair because we finally had the Keating professorship. Right. And uh, so that, again, gave it a, a, actually a um, more intimate connection with Columbia. They were had one, but... Uh, because Jerry King is that is downtown. that Keating professorship moved to Icon? And uh, no, it's moved up to Columbia. It did. Yeah, that's where it was originally. Was it at the money in Columbia? It was at Columbia, right? And any money in Columbia's coffers goes nowhere else. I wouldn't. I don't blame them. But, yeah, right. Exactly. In fact, they've asked us to send them James Keating's portrait, which we, I've denied them because uh -huh. he was our chief of medicine and function to recruit Dr. Van Italy. But in these days you could take a picture of it, I guess, and they could reproduce it if they wanted to. Well, they, they have done that with uh, the grandson came and had his picture taken with Keating's portrait. Ah, interesting. And uh, so that he can share that if he so chooses. No, I, I mean, I remember Keating being talked about when I first came in 1975, but I, I never... No, he had died already. Yeah, I, I, but, he, but he was always in people's conversation that I remember. Now, what, what would you consider your highlight of, of this period of time in your life? Are Highlights you... of St. Luke's? Yeah, your career. Mm. Or your family or oh, anything no, I, else. Oh, well, I mean, my, my family is wonderful. I mean, the highlights of both my sons and my mm -hmm. grandchildren. But at St. Luke's, I, I guess, you know, I had, as I told you before, when I was in medical school, I went to Grand Rounds and I saw Bill Schwartz and decided I wanted to be him. Mm. Uh, I often wondered what he would think about my, my career. He, he died around uh, eight or nine years ago. Um, we always had a terrific relationship, but he was different from me. He was a real Renaissance kind of guy, one of the founders of the nephrology profession. Um, I think the highlight is is that I, for 38 years, I trained wonderful fellows and they gave me a wonderful sense of satisfaction. And uh, <clears throat> I was intellectually stimulated every day. I mean, I would go in and learn something. People would teach me something every day of my life. And, uh, you know, at retirement, trying to find that milieu is the hardest thing to do. It is. Well, with all the student debts occurring now, did you ever have a financial problem going through school? Or? No, I never did. No, it, that's an interesting question, but I always worked, always got proud of my tuition paid. Now, you know, we're old enough, so when I went to MIT, MIT was the highest tuition in the country, $900 a year. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I don't changed. know what that is in, in 2017 dollars, but... It must be around 60000 Yeah, no, it's, it's very expensive. 
So, but I always worked. I always took jobs that paid me or deferred my tuition or within whatever. within the hospital setting or the medical institution. Yeah, I'm usually within the university. Within the yes, at MIT, I took a job with a professor that I adored, who I lived with as a, as a freshman in the dormitory, and I would. He was a metallurgist, and he would he would. Uh, do alloys, and I can still remember polishing these surfaces so that he could look at it under his, I think it was x-ray diffraction that he mm -hmm. was using at that, at that time. Um, but I did, I did all kinds of interesting things. In, in, uh, in college, I was the steward of the fraternity house, oh. which meant I had to hire the chef and do the, do the menus and so forth. One year, organizational skills. Yes, but it gave me room and board in the in the fraternity. That helps. So one one year there was a snowstorm, mm. and the chef couldn't make it in. And here there were fifty guys in the waiting fraternity for their house, dinner, waiting for their dinner. So I called my mother, and I said, "There are two turkeys, dads, two two forty pound turkeys downstairs. What do I do?" She said, "I." I think she said three, 350 degrees, 20 minutes to the pound, something of that order. So I, I put them in the oven and I made some jello, which I had no I had. The best job I ever had was when I was younger. I was a <clears throat> kitchen hand at an all girls camp. Wow. In my <laughs> junior year and senior year in high school. So that was a wonderful job. But so I learned a few things about how to deal. So I shoved the turkeys in the oven, and I carved them just before they were served. Of course, the guys were delighted because the chef would have carved them at noon and served them the dry meat at, at dinner did. time. <clears throat> but the only thing I didn't do, didn't do, I put my hand into the turkey after they were done, and of course I hadn't taken the gizzards out, they were in a plastic bag in the, <laughs> in the middle of the turkey. Yuck. So I, I remember that story. <clears throat> How did I get onto that? So, I'm, I'm basically a very happy person. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of part of me. And uh, oh, you are. What do you miss? I miss the everyday, and I, I had the opportunity when talking to Millie yesterday that I really miss coming in and seeing everybody, hearing everybody's news, and uh, uh, then going to rounds. I do miss board attending in the old-fashioned times. One of the things that uh, that the Mount Sinai takeover did was to eliminate the specialty uh, wards. We had a renal service, an inpatient renal service, and that was a wonderful opportunity. It was a general medical ward with patients with kidney problems. Right. And it, it was terrific, and I, I fought very hard to keep it. And among the things that I wondered about whether but one of the things they decided to use to ask me to leave was that I had written a long list of questions to Barbara Murphy, asking her basically how I could help. This was before, just having a go. And among the things I put on the list was, was there any chance that we could continue with a, really? real, with a renal special unit? I don't think she liked the fact that I sent her this list of questions in the first place. Um, but I think I, I fought hard for trying to make Well, she's a nephrologist. And she, yeah, but she didn't care. She's long gone from nephrologist. And she was a transplant nephrologist, which is different. From yeah, me. well, she's looking at mechanisms of rejection. I mean, that, that was her, that's her area of interest. Right, right. And she's a very bright person, very competent person, no question about it. And her teacher was one of my fellows, which I pointed out to her. In Ireland, the uh, first paper that I published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation was with her teacher as one of the co-authors. Mm -hmm. She wasn't terribly impressed with the but, fact that I taught him. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe her experience wasn't as good as yours. Well, I think she liked him. She was felt positively about him. But what what do I know? I mean, Would you recommend a career in medicine now? That's a good, good question. Good question. I do see 
my most recent fellows. The most recent of my best <coughs> fellows was a nip. I don't know whether you know a nip. A nip is just leaving to go to Denver. Mm. So he's taking a position. Right, at the University of Colorado. Um, I look at him, and he's pretty much in my mold. He comes from India, so his background is completely different. But he's very happy and very challenged. Um, and I look at Stephen Smith, mm -hmm. who's a very competent nephrologist. And he's staying on? Yep, and Jermaine, who stayed on because they adapted to her life. But she's an extraordinarily capable um, nephrologist. Very articulate, too. Very, very articulate. Very articulate. And Ira Mizells, who I, who I recruited. Um, so I think, you know, do, I look do, at these people and they're doing well. Did you have any uh, relationship with James Hilton at all? I don't really know whether you had any uh, overlap Remember the time. name? Yeah, okay. Because uh, James, James was a nephrologist, though there was no separate division. Uh, he wasn't there by the time I got there. Okay. He, was, he wasn't there then. There was no nephrologist other than uh, David David. Yep. I remember when and David And there was a left. woman who, who left, because he, he had left a couple of years before. And then there was a woman who he trained, I can't remember her name, who I never met either. Who mm. was gone by the time mm -hmm, I got mm -hmm. there. But... Um, no, there was no, nef no nephrology at, uh, at St. Luke's. It was interesting. It was, that was one of the great challenges for me was to build a division because there wasn't any division. Right. That, that was Van Italy's goal, was yes. to build divisions. And one of the reasons why uh, research in the lab didn't really f end up functioning very well was the lab they gave us was on plant nine or wherever the top of plant was. And it was really a very ancient kind it, of place. It well it was put up in eighteen ninety six. Yeah, so yes. right. I understand. Yeah, it was. Anyway, I mean, it was got, not built for a lab. We got enough experiments out to publish them, but it was really all. It was kind of a lonely place, out of the way. And if you want research to thrive, you have to have the researchers together. They have to be in. Yeah. To be able to interact with one another. And, Right, there's a mutual pollination that's Without required question. for fertilization Without to take question. place. Yeah, no question, no question. That, that's, what, that's what the collegiality of the, even the dining room uh, served. Right. A, lot of, a lot more exchanges. Now everybody's in their cubbyhole with their uh, cell phones, and so it's become right. very separate uh, and no longer with this in, in more intimate interchange. Well, right. is there anything else you'd like to add? We've, just enjoyed this story. No, no, this was very good. I, <clears throat> your cell phone story was, was interesting because you and I have grown up through the period where, where uh, the, first, the first innovation, if you will, was a beeper. Yes. And because before that it was just overhead Noisy paging. <clears throat> paging, paging. Right. And you couldn't be out of the hospital. <clears throat> now you can be right. out of the hospital. Right. Right. Well, the, the beeper allowed you to get out of the hospital, right? Not too far. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at first with the local beepers. Yep. Then they started with the long range yeah, beepers. Yeah, long range beepers. And then the cell phones. It's the whole thing is so so interesting. The and and the conversion from paper charts to like computerized time. charts. Um, you know, nobody knew all the problems. Paper charts certainly had their problems. But so do the computerized charts. Oh, a, a different type of problem. Yeah, different type of problems. Different type of problems. <clears throat> They're trying to figure out how they can um, note the cut and paste phenomenon, which is yeah, like how even stop the continuous. Cut and paste. Yeah, they're supposed to be able to signal it now when a chart contains cut and paste. I mean, it just you know that nobody has to nobody has to think if you can do that. Uh, right, which is why you find incredible discrepancies in a medical legal record. Yeah, I'm which, sure. Which is a, a lawyer's haven. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, gotta, you know, at least when you had to write, you could write a short note, but you had to write something. You had to think about what you were writing down. You couldn't copy what you, you could say the same thing you said before, but <clears throat> you had to write it down. Right, right, right. 
So wonderful. I <clears throat> can't think of anything else to ask. Um, any other thoughts? I, you know, share. Nope. If you're in a different part of your life and you stay active, that's the bottom line, I think, for most of us. Uh, Without question. I always tell the residents, you don't turn your brain off at 4 o'clock. Because <laughs> now we've, oh, by the way, the hours are expanding. I know, I know. I remember I, we didn't talk about that, that we lived through the limitation of the hours and now they're expanding them again. <clears throat> I always felt that the, that, <clears throat> that out continuity, con yeah, continuity was, probably, was probably yeah. more important than limiting hours. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, being tired is, I can remember a, an intern at uh, St. Luke's, a wonderful intern. I don't remember his name anymore. And I saw him in, uh, oh, it must have been in May or June. And he was so lagging and he was so slow. And then I saw him on July 2nd or 3rd and he was so happy. Cause now, and I said to it's him, finished. now you're a resident. <clears throat> you have to pay the price of being an intern. Medicine has found no other way to teach young medical students how to be doctors, as far as I'm concerned. You can't learn the art right. from journals, texts, or electronic away. records. You have to do it. You have to do it with people. And you have to learn how to be called in the middle of the night. And start thinking. And to start thinking. And I can remember when I, one day when I was an intern and I didn't see my wife until the next day, and she said, my God, how did you get a black and blue mark on your thing? And I said, I re remembered that at the University of Chicago, in those days, we slept, we, when we were on call, we slept in a room, and there were two beds, and the telephone was up here. And the phone rang in the middle of the night, and I went to get the telephone, and hit, hit myself in the face with the, <laughs> with the telephone, and no recollection of it. Then I had to walk a mile of corridors, because the University of Chicago was, in those days, was very Spread inefficient. Out. Yeah. They arranged to get to the patient. And, uh, oh God, I can remember the patient too. The patient was dead when I got there. He mm. was this 75 pound dead patient oh. being resuscitated by this 200 pound nurse. Oh, what a picture. And, and my goal, and of course, the why I remember it was, I couldn't find the chart. Oh. The chart wasn't right there. The intern taking care of the patient had taken the chart back to his room with him. <gasps> so I had no idea if that no -no. patient yeah. was on the way to death or was it this an acute event? I had no idea. I'll never forget that. It turned out that it, the patient was dying, but... But it's helpful to I know. Mean, it's helpful to know, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Because right? you feel so responsible. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And what could you have done? Yep. Yeah, that's what the CPC used to do. Yeah. At least the New England Journal still has it. Yes, thank, thankfully but, so. Well, Dr. Cortell, thank you so oh, it's much been a pleasure. for thank sharing you very this much. time thank you all with us. Very much. Stanley Cortell, MD, MPH, FACP, retired professor of medicine from Columbia and the Icon School of Medicine.